Romans. Romans chapter 1 this morning. You say, Pastor, wrong book. It's supposed to be Revelation this morning. Well, it is supposed to be Revelation this morning, but it'll be all the better because uh, it isn't this morning, ultimately. Uh, the truth of the matter is that as I was preparing for this week's message in Revelation, uh, one of the things that really uh, was one of my conclusions was that we need about five service hours uh, for me to be able to preach the message I wanted to preach this morning, and that is impossible. And uh, it also is that there are so many things in the particular context that we're preaching right now that are so timely today. Things that really, really uh, people are being inundated with false teaching, false doctrine about. And so there are things that we really need to be have some solid answers that really settle us in the faith on. And so realizing that I can't preach it in under five hours, I realize I'm going to have to have a pretty hefty handout for everybody just to kind of uh, be able to organize and settle everything uh, and, to, and give you a lot of other scripture along with the message that I want to preach. And I'd like to do that using PowerPoint as well. I wasn't prepared for that this morning. And uh, just uh, actually yesterday made the decision, you know what, I'm not going to preach this message until it will really benefit people to the fullest. Now, that being said, you better be here next Sunday morning. I'll put a lot of effort into next Sunday morning's message. And uh, you better be here for it because it really will be a help for you. So you say, well, Pastor, it's impossible for me to be here. Well, just make it possible. Uh, just just uh, disrupt whatever is the lower priority and, and change some things around. Just come. Just be here. Otherwise, it will be on YouTube. And Tony will have it uh, put up on YouTube along with the PDF to the handout so you can still get it online. And so if I should, that's a spoiler, isn't it? To be able to say, you know, you can, you can get it on YouTube. And, uh, you know, you can't get what you get here on YouTube. First of all, no one on YouTube will see me uh, fast drawing a bubble gun like I was this morning. That's just, that's not for YouTube. That's only for the folks that are here. And the other thing you can't get on YouTube is the fellowship. It's really tragic today that people are fellowshipping uh, more around, uh, actually not fellowshipping, the fellowship is being missed by people that are going online for preaching services and so forth. And it speaks to a lot of things. I think there are a lot of benefits in being able to find truth, but there's a lot of error that you oftentimes have to wade through in order to find truth. But uh, the thing that's missing is the fellowship of the believers and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, God's Spirit's here this morning. God is here. He's really here. Yesterday evening, we were with the teenagers. We looked at a truth that uh, David emphasized in Psalms, where he, uh, in Psalm 28, when he said, Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. If God's silent to you, it isn't because He does not speak. If God's silent to you, it's because of all the noise you're hearing instead of hearing Him speak. And uh, God's speaking. He's here this morning. His presence is here. And we want Him to be the preeminent presence. And so I want to read verse 16 of Romans chapter 1. And uh, then I would like to also go down to verse 28 and uh, read that as well. And then we'll pray for God's presence really to be the preeminent person here this morning. Verse uh, 16 of Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I was remiss in not mentioning verse 17. We'll read that as well. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And I'd like to read some more verses, but for sake of time this morning, let's go to the Lord's and ask His help. Father, please speak to us this morning. God, I pray for every individual that's here this morning that we would consider whether or not the gospel of Jesus Christ has been actually the power of God to salvation to us because of belief. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. 
Now this is a very, very simple passage of Scripture, but you're here this morning and you don't know on a personal way. You don't know whether Jesus is your Savior. In other words, you might not know. You, know, you might know what everybody knows and that, generally speaking, there's a God. I've met people and they vacillate on that. I've met people that say, absolutely, there, there definitely is a God. And you ask them, well, how do you know there's a God? And they can give you reasons why they think there's a God. Well, I just feel like there is. You know, everybody just feels like there's a God when they're born. We'll see that in our text this morning, but that actually is true for everybody. I just feel like there is. You say, Pastor, that's not a valid reason. Well, it is kind of nuts, isn't it? For individuals who evolved from slime to come up with a notion that there's a God in worship. I'm just, I just want you to answer that question in your mind. Is that kind of nuts? You say, Pastor, well, we just naturally worship God, but we evolve from slime. How did that advance or develop evolution? To worship a non-existent God, if that's the truth. Well, it isn't the truth. We're created and we know it. You're created and you know it. Matter of fact, when eternal matters uh, come into the forefront of your priorities, you know there's a God, actually, don't you? Once in my life have I ever been at a funeral where somebody said they didn't believe there's a God. They angrily stormed out, and um, I thought, man, for not believing there's a God, you're sure affected by something. Once in my life. But you know one of the places that I notice people don't debate whether or not there's a God is a funeral? Because we know we're eternal, don't we? We know that you know, that there's more to this life than last. Um, is it Jenna Hager Bush was telling some spooky Halloween story about how she believes that she saw spirits in the White House, that the White House is haunted, and that kind of nonsense. There are other people that believe that as well. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Abraham Lincoln's ghost, John Adams' wife's ghost, and so forth aren't living in the White House. They're not. They're actually not. Uh, I've read uh, John Adams' wife's testimony. She was a believer in God. She's in heaven today. Amen. That woman's in heaven today. She's not in the White House. But there is probably a devil that is imitating her in the White House. Maybe. And no, it is... I almost made a joke. It's not a joking matter. So, uh, The fact of the matter is, is that devils do, spirits do imitate people. You know, there's a lot of um, trickery in magic. A lot of people do, you know, you, illusionists and so forth uh, do things and they're, they're, and they're sneaky or they're trickery and they're really smart. They, you think they could read your mind, but actually they just they know how the mind works. And they can lead you to think a certain way and they can get you to pick a particular card out of a deck of cards. And I mean, there's some, some neat tricks. But there are also some things that aren't tricks. I don't give place to the devil. I try to make it a habit not to give place to the devil. And so I try not to talk about the Satan. I try not to talk about um, spirits that aren't God's spirit because they're created beings. They're created spirits just like we are. And I'm not going to give them an exalted place or give them fear or give them a relevance that, they, that the devil doesn't deserve. I don't want to give the devil a platform, Amen. if you will, and talk about it. I want to promote Satan. Uh, there are devils, though. There are demons. They're real. And sometimes people uh, will you know, act as mediums for devils. They'll let a devil come in them and speak. You know, ask the question, you know, sometimes people will be there and a guy who's a medium will have a devil telling him things about somebody and pretending to be someone that person knows. They'll be saying, well, you know, and they'll be telling stuff. there's no way in the world that that medium could know. And they'll be giving them details about something maybe only the two people, the, the deceased and that person are talking about. Well, that's because devils are real. And if you're a believer in Jesus, a devil can't live in you, but a devil can be in a room. And he can observe things and see things and he can mimic people. I can do imitations of people. I'm not particularly good at it. But I can do imitations of some people. Can you? My poor mother. My dad, my brother, and I all have the same vocal qualities. 
Like we can imitate each other. We have the same voice and pitch. And so I can just answer the phone like my dad does or like my brother does or he can answer the phone like my dad or like me or my dad can imitate us and we can mess my mom all up. And now with phones, you know, when you can, when you can add a person. The other day my mom called me and uh, I was talking to my brother at the same time so I just added him to the call and muted my phone. So she knows she called me. She's looking at her phone. It's got my name, my number on it. She calls me, and my brother answers. And he answers his way. And so she's trying to figure out whether it's me pretending to be my brother, or whether my brother's with me, or whether it's actually him. And so, you know, he's leading her along. Of course, I'm listening in. And she's like, Ryan? No, this is Daniel. Oh, you're not either. Yes. And you go through the whole spiel. He convinces her he's Daniel. Well, how did I get you? I was trying to call Ryan. Well, you tell me. I just answered the phone. You know, and he, we give my poor mother, we give her a very, very, uh, we like to, she taught us these things, by the way. So it's one of those things where, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, roost, they come back to roost or whatever, the, the, whatever, the chickens come back to roost. Yeah, so I guess we're all chickens. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so we can imitate each other and we can, mess with my poor mother for quite a bit and uh, we generally do and she tries to give us back her own way as well um, that's all in good fun but the devil's a liar and what he does he's not just funning he's trying to destroy and sometimes uh, mediums will have someone who a person new and they'll tell them things and they always have the same conclusion it's very interesting matter of fact uh, Samuel Clemens actually wrote about mediums in his day and the things that the Spirit said. And I thought, you know, it's interesting they say the same kind of things today as they, as they did back then because it's the same lie the devil wants everybody to believe. So they'll tell them some things and convince them that it's actually their deceased uh, loved one or relative or friend or whoever speaking. And then, of course, he always has a message for them. And the message is always, tell them we're okay. We're very happy here. Don't worry about anything. Uh, we're just, you know, basically walking to and fro on the earth, roaming up and down in it and having a good time. And that message translated actually is don't worry about eternal life. Don't worry about eternal life. They'll imitate someone who's in heaven and say, don't worry about eternal life. They'll imitate someone who's in hell and say, don't worry about eternal life. We're just fine. They'll be acting like they're speaking. It is not that person speaking, my friend. It's a devil. And he's giving you the message the devil wants you to hear, which is that your eternal destiny does not matter. This last week, uh, a friend of, of my wife's lost his wife. Somebody my wife I went to school with, and, and she, she, she died suddenly last week. I don't know the details of it, but I, I think that probably that was unexpected last week. This last week, I heard about someone that died in an accident, and that was unexpected this last week. Death is a reality. And as real as death is, eternity is much more of a reality. You'll be alive in eternity for far longer than you have to live in this life. Isn't it so? If we're eternal beings and we're made in the image of God, we're going to live somewhere forever. And eternal life is much longer than it is. And we actually know all these things because God put them in our heart to know it. And I just want to challenge you today about the gospel. I just want to preach a message about the gospel uh, today. And uh, I hope it will be an actual help to you. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 is introducing uh, the, the church at Rome. And he's mentioning, as he begins to get into actual material, he's mentioning his love for preaching the gospel. How much he loves preaching. Now, he must have loved it because he sure got beat up a lot for it and kept on doing it. So there must have been something there, right? When a guy goes to town, they throw rocks at him until he's dead, leave him laying there, and then he barely survives, gets up and goes to the next town and does a repeat of the very same thing. There's got to be something in it, doesn't there? Mm -hmm. You ever wonder why? You know, all but the Apostle John were put to death for their faith. They were murdered because they believed in Jesus. Do you ever wonder why it was so important to them to preach the gospel? Because it's real and it's truth, and because eternity was more of a reality uh, than this life. And friend, I want to tell you something. That's an actual fact. Let's say I'm only 40 years old, but I'm already 40 years old. And I can tell you that if I live an average life expectancy, life passes like that. 
and is gone. But eternity is forever. And the preparation in this life for eternity is something that is of vital importance. It is something which cannot be overemphasized. How much uh, we need to be prepared for eternity. So Paul said in verse 15, he said, As much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome, at Rome also. And then he said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I love the, that people have taken that and put it into song form. Uh, there's a quartet that sings, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And it's a beautiful song. I, it, it rings in my head every time I read this verse. And I'm singing in my mind right now with three of my other conscious, consciousness. Is, is, whatever. <laughs> but Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he uses an explanatory conjunction to say, because, for. It's the power of God unto salvation. And my friend, salvation is something that needs to be preached. Matter of fact, you're not preaching if you're not preaching salvation. That's a fact. You're not preaching Jesus. You're not preaching the gospel. Uh, you're not preaching. Preach is to proclaim good news. And the good news is salvation. Salvation is deliverance. And deliverance is from something. Listen, my friend, the fact is, is that the whole world's in trouble. The whole world has a problem. We're born with it. It's the problem of sin. It's the problem of consequence for sin. Listen, uh, you may not rate your sin as a major problem, but I understand and know this, that Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The problem with sin is that we've fallen short of God's glory. And in order to be forever with God and not in a place of judgment forever separated from God, which is what the word death means, you and I need to understand the wages of sin is death. And we need to understand that sin's a big deal. And sometimes... You know, we can understand why we sin. You ever give an explanation? You ever apologize for something with the explanation for it? I'm sorry. The only reason is because... And uh, you ever realize how disingenuous actually an apology like that actually is? You know, I'm sorry. The only reason is because it's really... You know, what do we say? That's not an apology. You're not really sorry. In other words, you don't really think what you did is such a big deal. You think you did it because somebody else did something else and you think you only responded, and so it's not such a big deal. But the fact of the matter is, is God's never done anything to you. You hear me this morning? God has never done anything to you, and everything you've ever done that sin is against Him. And you can't say, God, I'm sorry, but you have to understand. God understands very well because He gave His Son to die on the cross for sin. He understands how important it is that sin be handled that it be judged by a just judge. You know, <laughs> I'm for leniency, aren't you? I like leniency, but sometimes I'm not for it. Right? I want leniency, but sometimes I don't want it. How many times should a person uh, be pardoned, for instance? You know, the disciples asked Jesus that, didn't they? How many times should a man sin? I forgive him. Seventy times? Or just time, seven times? And Jesus said seventy times seven. And he wasn't even limited to that. It was an exaggeration. It was a hyperbole reality of it is, is that Jesus forgave our sins and God's very, very merciful, but I'm not nearly so merciful. Um, I'm actually pretty easy going when somebody does something to me. And that's really a fact. I, I, uh, I think that people that would have ever done something uh, to me, either taken something from me or destroyed something of mine or disrespected me, or something like that would know that I'm usually pretty lenient about it. I'm pretty understanding because I know what kind of stuff I'm made out of. And I can remember some things that I've done. And so I just think, well, you know what? It's just me. It's not a big deal. You ever met a person that just seems like consequences don't matter? I mean, I try to. I actually try to obey the, the traffic laws. I really do try. You say, Pastor, do you always obey them? No, I don't always obey them, but I try. And I, actually, I actually understand the value of a speed limit in a school zone. I'm not, I don't, I just, I just try not to drive in school zones. I don't like being around there, but I understand the value of a speed limit in a school. They're annoying, but I can see why it's just not a great idea to go barreling down the road when uh, people are crossing the street, especially heedless people who have earbuds in their ears and they're looking down at a cell phone and so forth. You know, it's just, it's, it's not, it's not good for safety. You might teach them a lesson, but they might not ever learn it. So, the reality of it is, is that, you know, I understand traffic laws and I try to abide by them. Sometimes inadvertently, 
Sometimes carelessly I uh, break a traffic law, and I really appreciate if a judge is lenient toward me. I don't have anything on my record because judges are lenient to me. I don't pay the traffic attorneys. I go to court. And yes, Your Honor, I did. And I'd like, <laughs> I'm just asking you to go easy on me. And I've been very successful that way a couple times in my life. I've just had judge say, yeah, you know, you've got a good record. I can tell it, you know, you weren't, you know, uh, you, you weren't trying to speed. I, you know, we'll just, we'll just wipe this off. And I appreciate that, do you? Mm -hmm. I don't get a ticket every week. Sometimes, you know, and I've been driving, you know, for 100 years, so this, this sounds like it happens all the time. But sometimes I've been pulled over and officers told me about something that's an infraction, but they've looked at my record and they've decided not to do anything about it. You know, you got a good record. I'm not going to do anything about it. And I appreciate that. But if I had a bad record, they'd have written me a ticket. You know why? Because they understand if you have a cavalier, careless attitude toward the rules of the road, you haven't learned your lesson, so you need some consequences. Okay, but you know, it's kind of a fine line to draw to decide who needs consequences, right? There are guys that drive for a living, and one more ticket, they lose their job. That's a pretty major consequence. I'm not sure I want to be the one that gives it out, but you know what? If they're going to kill somebody, maybe it'd be better for them to do something different. I don't know. And sometimes I'm just glad that other people have to judge and not me, aren't you? The reality, though, it is that I, I want judges to be lenient, but there are times when I don't want judges to be lenient. I heard this last week about people that are being released from prison. And I think they need to lock them up and leave them there. They don't need to be lenient to that person. You know, that's my opinion, right? And I don't think the judge ought to be lenient. Now, I want to tell you something. There's only one good judge. God. And if He were good, and you and I are to look at Him, we'd have to say a good judge judges things as they ought to be judged. In other words, He meets out consequences as they're deserved, doesn't He? And a good God then must judge all sinners. Nobody is okay with someone receiving lenience and they not receive it, are they? You ever see somebody, it's like, yeah, they can do whatever they want. Nobody, you know, it's like, they have no consequences. I've been in that situation before, teacher's pet. You ever go to, anybody here ever go to school with a teacher's pet? They hear the teacher's pet? It's like, you know, you did that, it's the most terrible thing in the world. They did the same thing. It's like, well, isn't that cute? You know, it's like, what? You know, parents' pet? Anybody had a parents' pet? You know, <laughs> the sibling that's like, why is that cute when they do it? Why is that cute when they say it? It wasn't cute when I did it or I said it. Well, you're just not cute, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that if God's good, He's going to judge sin. And you and I have a problem with a God that doesn't judge sin. That's the honest truth. If you're going to be honest, and I think we should be with the matter of eternal destiny, that's something we need to deal with. And so Paul here says that salvation is something that he likes to preach. You see that? The gospel is the power of God to salvation. But there's a condition that has to be met for it to be the power of God to salvation, and that is that it has to be believed. You see that? To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, if we were preaching through Romans as we recently did, there would be a theme that we would see all the way through this letter that Paul wrote to this church, he's writing to a church that's partly Jewish and partly uh, Gentile, or the generic term here used for Gentiles is Greek. That is not Jewish. Other nations. Gentile just means other nations. And the gospel is God's power for salvation to Jews and to Gentiles. Now they were having trouble in the church kind of understanding, am I Jewish? Is salvation of the Jews? Uh, am I a Gentile? Can I be saved and still be a Gentile? What am I? And Paul hashes that out in Romans. That isn't our message here today. But one of the things that he begins by explaining is that Jews need to be saved and Gentiles need to be saved. Now, which one are you? There isn't a third category. Jews need to be saved. Gentiles need to be saved. Which are you? And he gives the reasons in chapter 2. Uh, if you go down to chapter 2, after he draws the conclusions in chapter 1 that, we'll, that we'll, we'll finish with here in a minute, he goes on to say, Therefore, this is a conclusion of the things that he said about the consequences of unbelief. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, 
thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest, doest the same things. Notice verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, here he's simply saying any person who judges is a person that's condemned by their own judgment. If you ever been a parent, uh, and, and I, I technically haven't, but <laughs> if you ever been a parent, um, you understand what it is to be condemned by the same thing that you judged by, right? Yeah, you get after your kids about always throwing things away or always doing this, always with Anthony all the time, I'm always giving him instructions, and I'm always thinking, man, I better be consistent with the instructions that I give him. Sometimes I say, well, you, and I'm like, well, you're right, I better take care of that right now, huh? You know, because the same judgment that you judge with, you're condemned by unless... Uh, you do the things that, you, that you, you're judged by. And the fact is, if any of you have ever looked at someone and thought that they deserve consequences for sin, you're condemned by the same thought. Pastor, I don't judge anybody. Well, you have before, so you're already counted. <laughs> right? You're, I mean, honestly, I've come to a place in life when I think, you know, I need to be pretty careful about condemning people. Because I'm such a lousy person myself. You know, I better, better, better watch what I say about them because, man, you know, we saw Wednesday night in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 that every man that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And you think you're all right, but you might be right now, but you might fall from being all right. You might do something later, right? So we'll look out. Watch out. Okay, but we're condemned by our condemnation or we're judged by our judgment. And if you were to if you were to read further chapter two, chapter three, you would see that the law of God is written in the hearts of the Gentiles and they're condemned by it. And if you were to read in chapter uh, chapter three as well, you'd see that the Jews have committed to them the oracles of God. They have the law of God written and they're condemned by it. You're condemned by what you know. Now I just want to draw a simple conclusion here, if you'll permit me, this morning. So how is it that every one of us know there's a God? We started off by saying that. Notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, notice that hold the truth. Every one of us holds the truth about who God is. Is it as confusing for you as it is for me to sift through denominationalism and religion? Not only do you have a multiplicity of religion, you have the complication of multiplicity of denomination within the religions. Don't you? I mean, there's Muslim, and there's the types of Muslims. There's Judaism, and there's all the different types of Judaism. There are Christians and the denominations of Christianity and the breakdown of the differences between the denominations of Christianity. And the fact of the matter is, is that if you're just objective and open-minded, and you say, I just all I want to know is truth, I don't have enough years to study up. Do you? I can't figure out. If I were to consider everything that everyone says represents God, I don't have a long enough lifetime to do it. There is too much lost with religions that have died out. I suspect if they've died out, they're probably not the truth. But there's just too much lost for me to look at everything, isn't there? Being objective or open-minded does not mean that we consider everything that is there to be considered or weighed. We're not afraid to consider anything that is presented to us, but you cannot possibly have all the information that may be had in order to objectively determine which religion is correct on the basis of each religion's merit or presentation. Isn't it true? Can't do it. Can't be done. So how in the world could any person actually know there's a God or know who God is? Because we do know who God, there is a God, don't we? How can a person arrive at truth? That's the question, and that's an important one, isn't it? for each of us. Well, the Bible says that which may be known of God in uh, verse 17 is uh, manifest in them. 
For God hath showed it unto them. If I'm going to know who God is, He's going to have to tell me. Right? You ever met that, well, if God showed me, I'd believe it? Well, actually, that's about the only way anybody actually does know God. Is that God has showed Himself to them. I said a minute ago, the Bible promises that where two or three are gathered together in, in, in uh, my name, there am I in the midst of them. So Jesus Christ represented, uh, Jesus Christ is represented by God's Spirit in this room here today. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, He's here and all of us may or may not be aware of it. Of God's physical presence in this place. I mean, God's spiritually, physically. God's Spirit is physically in this place today. Now I suspect... I suspect we're all aware of it, but it may be possible. Some of us may be like, "Why? Well, I don't exactly feel anything. I don't know. You know, I don't know if God's actually speaking to me here today." Well, He will if you let Him. But the Bible says that way it may be known of God is manifest unto them, for God hath showed it unto them. I believe this is my belief. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying it's this way for everybody, but I believe that at least several times in each person's lifetime, God manifests Himself without our asking Him to do so. Sometimes God talks to us and we didn't, we didn't ask Him to. We didn't say, God, are you there? Would you speak? But God told us something or God spoke to us and, and He wasn't necessarily invited. That usually comes in the form of conviction. usually takes the law of God that's written in your heart and says, what you did was really wrong, and you know it, and I'm going to judge you for it. And it's usually conviction. I mean, God just really just gives you the whammy. Now, we're able to do amazing things with our memory. We're able to forget things. We're able to push things aside and hope that they go away, and we're able to push things away. And the fact of the matter is, God the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and he does not, and the Bible says he'll not always strive, and he also does not force himself where he's not wanted. And so if you say to God, go away, well, you might be unfortunate enough to have him do just that. He might go away, he might leave you alone. Let me tell you something else about God, though. He'll come back if you ask him. Amen. Come back if you ask him. You know, sometimes for me as a believer, listen, I've had a lot of experiences where God's Spirit has spoken to me and I have had Him move in my heart and He's used His Word and taught me and, he, and He's just been very gracious to me. But there have been times when I've said, Holy Spirit of God, I need You to speak to me. I need to hear from You. Just like David said in Psalm 28 when he said, Be not silent unto me. God, I don't want You to be silent. I want to hear You. I want You to speak to me. I've asked God to and my friend, He has. Do you know just about any time I get to hear preaching besides my own, sometimes when I hear my own preaching, I just say, God, I just want to hear you. I just want you to speak to my heart today. I'm not talking about the speaker. I don't need the speaker to speak to me. I want you to take His words, and I want you to speak to me, and then I want you to add to His words. I want you to get specific. I want you to show me some things in my heart. Show me some things in my life. God, I want you to talk to me today. And you know when I invite Him to, the Holy Spirit of God does just that. He speaks to me. Now, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you actually can know that. Not only with the help of God's Spirit, but you can know it just by honestly asking, what are the requirements for a person to have believed the Gospel of God unto salvation? What are the requirements for it? Well, just that, to believe. Now, believe isn't you know, in just an intellectual assent, it's a commitment. Say, you know what? I'm putting my trust in that. It's just like if, if I were... I think I have one. I like this. If I were, you get to give this back, okay, Andrew? I got a $100 bill. Look at that. Looks fake though, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> now, if I were to... This isn't... This isn't... This is just make pretend for the service, okay? All right, but if I were to offer a hundred dollar bill to Andrew, if you want it, man, I got a hundred bucks for you. You want it? What's the catch? You got to, to give it back to me later. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, but just we're pretending here, okay? If this were, I don't want to give a hundred dollars just to prove an illustration. That's just too much. I got a twenty. 
Well, you can give me a 20. That'll work. Okay. All right. If I were to say I got $100, and honestly, if you want it or need it or, or just think it looks good and you, you'd like to have it, you, you can have it. It's offered, isn't it? Whose hand is it in? Mine. You want it? Patty's like, man, let me get that thing. See, it won't get it back. All right, so what do you have to do in order to get it? It's offered. Yeah. Now I'm not going to hand it to you. You've got to take it. All right, so. Okay, so you have to take it, right? So the deal is, is that, that salvation is offered to whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says the word whosoever actually means whosoever. Now you have to be a Calvinist and you have to redefine the meanings of a lot of words. You have to make all not mean all, whosoever not mean whosoever, and there's just a lot of words that you have to change their meaning of to try to say that salvation is not freely offered to all men, but it is. Amen. It is freely offered to all men, and anyone that wants it can receive it, and you receive it by just taking it or asking God for it. In other words, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I know He died on the cross for my sin. He was buried and rose again. I want the free gift of eternal life. God, I'm asking you, for the free gift. Now that doesn't need to be done publicly. I had people say, well, you know, they, they take Romans 10, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Did you pray out loud? Well, now the question is, are you saved? Yes. That's confessing with your mouth, isn't it? I've, con I've confessed Jesus to confess is to openly proclaim or declare. And the reality of it is, is it isn't the form or the method or even the actual words. It is understanding that Jesus died on the cross and you say, God, I want to be your child. I want Jesus to be my Savior. However you say that, however you express that, I want the free gift of eternal life, I believe. And receiving Jesus is believing in Jesus. It's not an intellectual assent. It's an actual act of believing. I I'm taking the free gift of eternal life. You don't have to do it with a witness. God's your witness. I'm just telling you, salvation is not complicated. Sometimes people would have you to believe you got to do this and this and this and this and this. No, you don't. You just have to receive it. And you're a fool if you don't. You hear me? No. You know, listen, there's nothing you can do to make your sin go away. You'll never convince a God who's never sinned that your sin is no big deal. You'll never be able to stand before God and try to compare the good things that you've done and make it as though... A judge judges good instead of evil. God doesn't judge good, He judges evil. He rewards good, but He judges evil. And there's a difference. You know, if you say, well, Pastor, you know, if, if I receive Jesus as my Savior, you're just discounting all the good deeds I've ever done. Not me. I'm not doing that. The Bible says that our righteousness, our good works, are as filthy rags. In other words, everything good you've ever done has been because you've tried to pretend that your sin is not evil. And your sin actually necessitated the death of Jesus Christ, His blood being shed on the cross, His innocent, uh, His innocent life being given for your sinful one, and you've just made light of that whole thing. That's evil. But the reality of it is, is that God's very good and gracious. And if you want to live for Jesus, you receive Jesus as your Savior, and you just want to do good works, the Bible says it's work created in Christ Jesus to do. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And God rewards good works. He hasn't forgotten your good. Amen. You're not saved by being good. You're saved because Jesus died in your place. It's a substitution. And you can't get saved any other way. You want to play, play it your way and say, well, God, you know, I've got another means or another method for eternal life. God's not having it. There's only one way, and it's Jesus. I spent some time reflecting and pondering and trying to think of a way that an individual could atone for their sins without the cross being necessary. The only thing I've concluded is that the only way that God's justice and His wrath could be satisfied against me without Jesus dying would be for me to die. And death being separation from God. In other words, I could say, well, you know, God, hell which was created for the devil and his angels, you could send me there and that'd be fair because of what I've done to you. The same would be true for each of us. That's why Jesus died. There's no other way. I think God is, you know, so clever that He could create the world, the universe, and man in His own image. And He can't figure out a good redemption plan that doesn't require Jesus to die. Now He proves His love for us. He 
and given Christ for us. Now, we know that this is true. Verse 20 says, The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The first question is, how can a person know truth? Well, you could ask God to speak to you. That's the answer to the first question. The second reason, way that you can know truth is that you could just look at the things that can be known, the things which can be seen, and you can draw the appropriate conclusions. I don't know about you, but when I look at a butterfly wing under a microscope, I don't conclude, wow, this was a terrific accident. <laughs> Do you? You ever look at a leaf, just a leaf of a tree and the complexity of it and the capillaries and the chlorophyll and all the ways that it's able to absorb sunlight and convert it and make oxygen and, and uh, just, uh, just the whole complexity and the beauty of life. And you ever just go like, well, you know, wow, that's, that's amazing. You know, that a dot smaller and a period on a page exploded and contained all the matter of the universe and voila. I wish my boat would maintain itself that way. I wish my roof would maintain itself that way. You know, just get better and better. No, it doesn't happen that way, does it? No, the, the leaf is designed. And designed by a creator who is so complex. Listen, I have seen some brilliant people and I've seen the work of people's brilliant hands. I'm one who appreciates craftsmanship. When somebody does a great job restoring or creating or building something, and I mean they just really, they do it in a really clever way, I am one to appreciate that. And there's no greater craftsmanship than creation, my friend. If you allow yourself a little bit of silence to sit on a mountaintop and gaze off and just look at the vastness of creation, you'll say that's pretty incredibly made. If you'll sometime just look at your hand and your skin and look at all the things that are happening there besides the bacteria, I mean. Look at all the things that happen for you to, to even be able to move a finger. You ever just move a finger and be like, whoa, that's cool. You know, and just by thinking it, I can do it. That's just incredible. You ever think of the, the electrical impulses in the, uh, the makeup of a human body and nerve centers and, and just the, the way that the blood flows through and muscles and ligaments and just the design of something as small as a finger on your hand and how it all works and realize, you know what? This is not an accident. Something didn't blow up and here I am. That's ridiculous. God made me. So the Bible says the things that are from creation of the world are clearly seen. Listen, He's not a God who has who is a one-hit wonder miracle God. Okay? You name the, the idol... And you can also name his strengths and weaknesses, right? An idol is almost like uh, when the when the kids play all, have all these role playing games, you know, where each character has different strengths or powers. You know, they have superpowers. That's what an idol is. He has the ability to destroy crops or make it rain or mess with the weather. An idol is a one hit wonder. He's got one thing that supposedly can or cannot do. God created the world and everything in it. In other words, he's an all-knowing, all-powerful creator God. There aren't creator gods, are there? There's only one. God who created the world and created man in his own image. You look at the way that we are created and what we alluded to earlier, and that's man's natural propensity to worship. We worship naturally, don't we? I'm going to tell you, everybody's got religion. Everybody does. Non-religious people are very religious about it. It is their life's calling to be religious, isn't it? Mm. I mean, people that hate God, I mean, it's their religion. You don't try and tell me any different. I mean, literally, it is their life's purpose to eradicate the world of religion. It's their religion. It's their God. They worship it. Uh, people that worship false gods, it's their religion. We're religious. Who made us that way? They may be corrupted, but who made us that way? God did. He put in us a knowledge of Him. And the Bible says one of the things that he did, though, is he, he made us reasonable about it. I love this. It says in verse 20, even his eternal power and Godhead. You know what Godhead is? I love in Proverbs when the Bible talks about, you know, the creation of the world who's, uh, you know, uh, held the wind in, in, a, in a garment and who's created all the things that Jesus created. What is his name and what is his son's name if thou canst tell? First verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God, Elohim. Elohim is a plural word, God. Uh, and literally means gods, 
but it's, a, it's in the singular form. In other words, God in the Old Testament, Elohim, is in the Trinity, the Godhead, is actually mentioned in the first mention of God in the Bible. God, Elohim, im, that suffix at the end is plural. And you know something about it? That resonates with us in our hearts. Why? Because God put himself there. Put himself in your heart. So how can you sift through all the religion? How can you sift through all the denomination? You don't have to. Just go straight to God. You can go right to God. And by the way, when you begin to go that direction, all of a sudden something is affirmed. That's true. It's true. Listen, you can give me a religious book and I can find the error in it. You name one, you give me one, and you know, for sake of memory, I might have to look it up. I might have to thumb through it. But I can find lots of error in religion. There's not a mistake in this book. Many of the time I've heard people say, you know, the Bible has contradictions, and I have just gone like this. I always ask the question, who told you that? Sometimes I can be patronizing my personality. <laughs> who told you that? Who told you their mistake? Where, where they tell you the mistakes are? How do they know? Do you know? A lot of people believe something. The Bible's a man-written book. So on, on uh, social media last week. You know, which, what part of the Bible did God personally write Himself? Well, He wrote the Ten Commandments with His fingers and Moses threw them down and broke them. That's the answer to that stupid question. I bet they didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, and then the other Ten Commandments are in the Ark of the Covenant. Who knows where that is? The reality of it is that God gave man the truth of the Scripture and it has a ring of truth to it. You ever just hear something and you're like, okay, all right, that's true. That's this book. That's this book, my friend. This is a book with multiple different authors, multiple different books, letters in it, and not a single contradiction. You can go ask the Google for some contradictions. And you can also ask the Google for why those aren't contradictions, and you'll get both. By the way, I'm just uh, channeling my inner George W. Bush by saying ask the Google, in case you don't know what that is. You can Google the mistake, or you can Google the contradictions, and you can Google the answer to those things. One of the things you realize is, yeah, the Bible doesn't contradict itself, actually. It is an incredible book. It has one theme from the end to the beginning, and it's written over a period of several thousand years. One thing from the end to the beginning is written over several thousand years. How in the world can a book do that? I'll tell you how. God gave it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness. In other words, holy men of God, according to 2 Peter, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God's Spirit told man what to write, and He did so in a perfect way. He gave it perfectly, and He preserved it perfectly. Psalm 12, 6 and 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. And then David said this. He said, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. From this generation, forever. God not only gave a perfect book, but He preserved it. And you can know that this book is God's Word. Have you ever read it and asked the Holy Spirit of God to reveal Himself to you in it? Because He will. He will. I challenge you. I dare you. You could do it in 30 minutes' time, but I dare you to make a month study of the book of John. The Gospel of John. I dare you. You're not an honest person. If you reject the Scripture and you've never uh, just opened your heart, opened your mind, read the Gospel of John, you're not honest. I, da I, I dare you after that to read Romans. You could read through Romans in a few minutes, actually. But I dare you to read it and just open your heart and open your mind and say, God, speak to me, and I'll listen. I dare you. Because this book's alive. The Bible says this book is quick and powerful. Quick means alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. The Bible says that it has the ability to um, divide asunder between the soul and the spirit. And the Bible says it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So many times I've thought I knew my motive and I've read the Word of God and He is God has gone, gotcha! This is what you say is your motive, but this is what it actually is because it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This book is real. This is God's Word. And I want to just tell you something, my friend. Just today, just the words of a mere man who is using the foolishness of preaching, I'm alluding to myself, simply with that, the Holy Spirit of God is taking that truth and He's confirming it in your heart right now. Isn't it so? Mm -hmm. Isn't it so? The Holy Spirit of God saying, yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. Religion can't do that. So how can I know truth? Well, just like that. God will reveal it to you. And then the Bible says uh, in verse 21 that, you, that there are two responses. I said conclusion a long time ago. Let's conclude. Because that, uh, when they're without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. Okay. So now, God's witness is against people, and they have a response. They have an opportunity to respond. If God's Holy Spirit goes, yes, the Bible's my word. Yes, I am God. Yes, the gospel is the only means for eternal life. You are faced with a yes yourself. Yes, I'll glorify you as God. Yes, I'll receive Jesus as my Savior. Period. Listen, if it's true, then all is left is the acknowledgement of the truth. Correct? In other words, if, if God's word is true, if, if this is the truth, and if Jesus is the only means for eternal life, and you know it, the natural response is to believe it. See, Paul said, to everyone that believeth. It's the power of God to salvation. This book is powerless. God Himself is powerless to save you if you will not believe. And so you'll either glorify Him as God, or the Bible says, because that when they knew Him God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. Now if Jesus died for your sin, what's your natural response? <laughs> Thank God. I was in a lot of trouble. You ever been in a lot of trouble and got bailed out? Amen. You've been bailed out? I mean, there have been plenty of times. I, was just, God, I, I, I have lived a charmed life. I don't know if charmed is the right word. I've been greatly blessed by God. And there have been just a lot of times when I've just been like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And God's just phew, taking care of me. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't deserve this, and so I'm just going to go ahead and have my terrible consequences instead. You ever met the person you couldn't help? That's just not right for you to help me. You want to play that with your eternal destiny? Thank you, God. I know it's not right. I know Jesus shouldn't have died, but He did, and I'm so thankful that He did. Thank you. Thanks for the gift. I offered the $100 bill. You're a fool not to take it. You won't need $100. Well, what if you needed $100 and I offered it? You still wouldn't take it. You know, every person needs to be born again. Every person who's ever been born is a sinner, and they need salvation. And if you don't receive it, you're just unthankful. You don't, you don't want to have to thank anyone, far less God. And verse 28 gives the last response, which instead of belief is unbelief, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Everyone's born with the knowledge of God in their heart, but there are people who can honestly say, I don't believe there's a God. Did you hear me? I'm acknowledging the existence of a person who does not believe. I'm somewhat of a skeptic about atheists, if you haven't picked that up. I'm, a, I'm an atheist for atheists. I've told atheists that. You're, you say you're an atheist, but I'm more of an atheist than you are. I don't believe you. Don't believe you. First of all, answer me this. When did you stop believing in God? And they'll tell you about they were in school and somebody you know showed how there couldn't be a God or, or this terrible thing happened when their mom and dad got divorced and you know, and, and if God's really couldn't be that cruel, or whatever, 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 they'll tell you when they stop believing in God. I don't believe you. You tell me you don't believe in God, I know you do. Or at least you did. But the Bible says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And um, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. All right, now, we can look at those particular sins that are committed by people who God gives over or allows to do whatever they want to do. But let me just tell you something. God will not force you to receive eternal life. I'd like to force you to. Listen, there isn't a person in here today that I want to see face a godless eternity. You hear me? First of all, you don't want to trust Jesus as your Savior. I think you're nuts. I don't know what's going on in your mind. I'm just, just sharing you with my opinion. I try to be frank with people so they know what I'm thinking. I don't know what you're thinking, but I think you're crazy if you don't think you need Jesus as your Savior. You do. And you know it. And so if you won't receive Christ as your Savior, 
God will allow you to do that. There's nothing I can do about it. I, I wish I could preach everybody into heaven, but I can't. I cannot do that. That's a choice. It's an individual choice of the will. <clears throat> and you'll have your consequences for your choices. You can come to a place when you can say, I honestly don't believe there's a God. And you're not even lying when you use the term honestly. Because God will let you do that. He put Himself in your heart. And you know it. You have everything that's necessary, even from creation. He's in your heart, and you have the witness of creation, but you can just try to deny that, come up with an alternative, and believe that instead. People have, haven't they? People do, do they not? I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it should and it oughtn't to, because God loves you so much that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This life's pretty short, isn't it? I mean, all of us feel like youngsters, don't we? I don't. We're we're all ages in here today, but all of us feel pretty young, actually. I've never met a person in their 90s or even 100 years old who didn't still feel in their mind like a youngster. Just feel like yeah, I'm just you know, I'm too young to be old. <laughs> you know, the reality of it is that life's going to pass us by whether we make it to to what we would consider older age or not. Might not make it to that. But eternity's forever. And my friend, eternity is the most marvelous thing. I wish I could talk about eternity here today. But if you receive Jesus as your Savior, you'll have eternal life and you can't ever lose it. And you'll have that to look forward to and you won't be quite so desperate about the fleeting opportunity of this life. You'll be able to live it for eternity and it'll matter. Now I'm going to finish the message today by concluding in prayer. But I want to have a private time before we finish praying this morning. I want to have a private time where you can you can talk to me. Okay? You can talk to God. Listen, you don't have to during the private time. But I, I just don't want to call anybody out or embarrass anyone here this morning. I wouldn't do that for the world. I wouldn't like it if someone did it to me. And I wouldn't do it to you. But I want to have a talk with everybody. So you be ready for that when we finish our prayer this morning before we finish the prayer. So let's finish our service. Father, thank you this much, this so much this morning for your word. And Lord, I just really believe that this is the message that You'd have me to preach today. God, I pray that every single individual in this room, Lord, that we'd be able to have a meeting in heaven someday, a meeting on the new earth. And we'd be able to do it multiple times over the thousands of years because we've all received Jesus as our Savior. Father, thank You for salvation. I thank You for the simplicity of it. I thank You for the witness of Your Holy Spirit. Thank You for making it so that we don't have to be uh, well-versed, well-read, or have to know everything in order to know truth. But that we can just know it because of the witness of Your Spirit and the witness of creation as we saw in Your Word today. Thank You for the witness of Your Word. Now, Father, I pray if there be an individual here today that does not know You as their Savior, I ask Your Holy Spirit right now would be able to be begin to just clamp down on their heart. Lord, take away, take away rest, privilege them to know, to know that your spirit is real and that you're speaking. I just pray that your spirit would just, just in a very, very still small voice, at their invitation, would say you need to believe in Jesus. Today's the day of salvation. You know, this morning, I want to just ask everybody the same question. I want to ask everyone to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And the reason would be that if you were to open your eyes, you might see someone else uh, raising their hand or, or looking up or making a decision. You wouldn't want to invade someone's privacy any more than you'd want yours to be invaded. Here this morning, and you say, Pastor Price, I know that there was a time when I met Jesus. When I received Jesus as my Savior, and God's, God became my Father, and, and I, I know the, that everything that the Word of God says this morning is true, and I've experienced it, I'm born again. If that's you this morning, would you just, just slip your hand up just so I can see it? Slip it up and hold it up for me. I know that I'm born again, and uh, I'm confident about that. I know what the Scripture says is true. Okay? Just slip it right back down. Now, as there always are, in, even in a small group, sometimes there are people, there are a number of individuals that, for whatever reason, don't raise their hand at a question like that. Maybe it's because of inattentiveness, maybe didn't understand the question. But also, oftentimes, it's because of just being honest, and I appreciate honesty. Here this morning, you say, Pastor Price, I have not received Jesus as my Savior. I know that to be a fact. 
And I know God's not done working with me yet, but I have not yet trusted Christ as my Savior. But God's speaking to me about it. He's talking to me about it. And uh, I just want you to pray for me. I, I want to have a real, re, real experience with God. I want it to be real. And God's dealing with me about that. Would you pray for me? Don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But I want I, I would covet your prayers and ask for that. Would you just slip your hand up? God's dealing with me about the matter of eternal life. Yep, just slip it back down. I see it. Slip it right back down. Okay. God's dealing with me about the matter of eternal life. Would you pray for me? Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Father, I just asked this morning for those individuals that have prayed and have indicated uh, or just openly stated that I, I don't have confidence about eternal life. Well, I pray that they would know several things. One, that today is the day of salvation. And two, I pray that they would know in a very personal way very soon how much it is that you love them and how much it is that you desire for them to be your child. So much so that you sacrificed your son on Calvary. And I pray that they would come to know you very soon. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your good attention this morning. You're dismissed. God bless you.